Why am I here? Why, why am I relevant? I do a couple web shows, one called Investing in Cannabis, which is all about early stage investing in the cannabis industry. The second one is called Infused. That's a documentary series all about how cannabis gets normalized. I'm going to do my best to uh, maintain my editorial credibility kind of here in the, the consumer process here. Somebody talked about tracking. Maybe, maybe it was Hua. It seems to be one of the most divisive issues in delivery is whether we show customers where the driver is right now, mm -hmm. how much information we give them about where that car is. There's obviously some risks associated with that. Uh, let's start in the middle, maybe. So we've decided Zach, to yeah, kind of uh, push it? away from that. What we're doing is we're showing a delivery time. We don't want to show exactly where our driver is. Essentially, that can lead to people kind of finding where your dispensary locations are, what may have you getting robbed. These are things we're not into. In the middle. Um, we will not show exactly where the driver is. We'll show about where he is. We keep the times accurate, but it's just he's in the neighborhood for the most part. Um, yeah, we, we show an ETA, we don't show exact location. It's, it's a little bit about safety, but for us it's actually more about user experience. I think, um, you know, you think of yourself as an end user when you've ordered from a site like Postmates, for example, and you can see the driver kind of driving around in circles and it makes you angry. Um, or when you call an Uber and he's not coming in your direction. So sometimes it can actually work against you, um, especially if you have a multi-point delivery model. So um, once a delivery driver gets there, they ring the doorbell or they call whatever the special instructions say, and they come to the door, Tell us a little bit about the standards around customer service and sort of what you set out for drivers or set out for the dispensaries drivers. Um, I mean, I've been things like, had things like been upsold to at the door. I've had sort of creepy experiences with drivers or maybe the wrong order. You know, what happens if they mess up the order? How much do you guys think about that far in advance? You know, when they get there, who they're talking to and how that experience goes. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's, it's very important, right? We do view the entire end-to-end -end experience as part of the user experience. There's definitely challenges there. Um, you know, in our model, the, the drivers are not our employees. Um, in fact, in most cases, they're independent contractors of the dispensaries. And actually, employment law, uh, you can't be very specific um, in telling independent contractors how to do their job or you could get sued. So it's, it's definitely a balance. Um, you know, we get reports all the time where drivers are aggressively asking for tips, um, things where, yeah, we, it's not really upselling because um, the platform really doesn't allow for that. But, you know, certainly situations where, for example, someone puts in the instructions, please come to the door, and the person just sits in their car and sends text messages and refuses to come in. Um, so, you know, we send that data down to the, to the dispensaries and, you you know, hopefully they're dealing with those drivers appropriately. Yeah, I but. think that's, that's a strength and a weakness of the platform model. Uh, it's certainly a strength where you can have this giant fleet of independent contractors, and, and we can certainly have a discussion or argument that there is no such thing as independent contractors in cannabis, because um, that's what my labor attorney told me after the lawsuit. Um, <laughs> We'll get to the lawsuit. That's a little. That weird. was a different lawsuit. We do go ahead and train the, any driver that is essentially uh, partnered with one of our partner dispensaries. So essentially, they are trained in the way we want them to treat the customer. Um, they're trained in the different promotions we're offering at that specific time. So essentially, when they go ahead and meet with the customer, they are essentially going ahead and telling the customer exactly what we're offering at that time. The customer is able to apply that to the next order. Ends up being a five-star user experience. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the delivery services that we work with, um, a lot of them are employed already. They're not independent contractors. Um, so I think what's interesting is uh, through retention, through people reordering, they see the same person. Um, there's comfortability in that, knowing that uh, Sandra's coming uh, and she knows exactly what I want. She knows how to handle the cat. When we you know, there's an issue. To, to W2. We took a, a huge hit on the bottom line, mm -hmm. but the customer experience was so much better because yeah. now the guys didn't have to rush. Yeah, They could just chill out, mm -hmm. sometimes a little too long, but they could just relax and spend some time. That's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. Got it. So sort of the final uh, part of that product feedback loop is reviews, right? So after they get it, after they try it, what do you do, and I'm going to start with Zach here because he's got some, some really strong uh, opinions on reviews. What do you do when you get a terrible review? Whether it's fair or not, inevitably that's going to happen. Contact How do you customer. deal with it? 
go ahead and send them a message at first. If they don't respond, we'll try and, try and go ahead and give them a call and find out exactly what happened. Um, granted, we feel like all of our experiences should be a five-star experience. So uh, we'll definitely take into account what the customer said, try and go ahead and give them some free things. So they'll go ahead and change the review and have a good positive experience and essentially order from us again. We've had um, some customers who've had negative experiences with us. And essentially, uh, we've gone ahead and done exactly what I said. And they became returning customers. Speak to, we had a little bit of a spicy moment in the green room. I, I have to bring this up because it was too entertaining, where uh, there is uh, some thoughts around or some conjecture that some of the pan uh, services on this panel had been sort of giving you purpose negative well, I, I, I think in just the industry in general, um, some of our competitors up here, Ease in particular, has attacked numerous competitors of ours with Yelp uh, reviews, one-star reviews, and gone ahead and posted, let's say, um, some sort of promotion for themselves. And essentially, we've contacted Yelp about that, and Yelp has gone ahead and removed the reviews on all of our competitors' pages. Let's say Ease did this about one year ago in about 50 different dispensaries throughout Los Angeles. And that was one of our main locations, um, Santa Monica, Culver City, Beverly Hills. It's a location we actually kill. Um, we're number one if you search Santa Monica marijuana delivery, whatever. Um, so essentially, they went ahead and did that to us. Long story short, we reported it to Yelp, and they went ahead and removed it in one second. It's getting Excellent. fun, Inspiring. ladies and gentlemen. Jim, I'll give you a record, chance no, to, uh, no idea what he's talking to reply to that. <laughs> Hey, uh, we, we can put a thread and we can put the proof. You've done it to many, many of our competitors, many of our competitors. No comment on that, Jim? I mean, I don't know what he's talking about, but... Uh, exactly. Right. Anybody, exactly. Anybody else have any comments on reviews or <laughs> what AJ, is any thoughts? Prevalent What's that? in the industry. Yes. Um, Speedweed gets the occasional bad review. No question about it. But the vast majority of our one-star reviews are just, they're absolutely made up. We couldn't fight it. We couldn't stop it. Um, we couldn't find these customers that had, the, you know, the, your, your driver tried to rob me and a sexualist, all kinds of crazy stuff. We couldn't find these customers. Eventually, we just stopped using the platforms. We're not on Yelp. We don't use Weed Maps. None, none of those mapping sites. We don't need them, and it just creates headache. You can see Zach is fired up, and he was fired up in the green room saying that my I love help, that he's fired up, by the way. As a host, I would as yeah. well. But I told him I don't even have the staff to 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 go out and do that, and I would never do that thing, to a competitor. You know, Yelp is we get a we get a lot of negative reviews on Yelp. Some of them fair, some of them unfair. I think you know being a, a little different than than Speedweed, where we are a platform, um, where you know as an end user you are interacting with ease from your perspective, but the delivery is actually happening from a dispensary that you may or may not even know the name of that dispensary. So if you have a bad experience, you're coming to Yelp and you're going to give ease. You know you um, can't really control because of the regulations. You know, we're not a dispensary, we don't control the dispensaries, um, and we can't really dictate certain things, but we're on the hook for everything. And your partners could go out and attack the other shops, and you maybe not even know. Yeah, I mean, like you, we basically kind of disengaged from Yelp. Yep. Um, it's just, it's kind of, it's a lot of noise. It is. Don't you think you can get your dispensaries to adhere to a certain standard, so to say? I mean, you can try, but at, at the end of the day, like some, like, some flower is going to be bad, and some people are going to think that they got ripped off, and they're going to go to Yelp and complain yeah, about I've it. Yeah, I've seen a yeah. 2.7 uh, star review for you guys in San Francisco, 227 reviews. Yeah, as I said, <laughs> we, we are, yeah, we're not a five-star review on Yelp uh, service. No, um, no we, not on Google either, I guess. No. Neither is Speedweed, neither is Speedweed. <laughs> Should have had that boss on Measure M, and, yeah. but uh, that's all right. Uh, Jim, you set it up perfectly. Jim, uh, you set it up perfectly to move in sort of to the policy and regulation uh, discussion here. There's a lot we could talk about in terms of 64 and Prop D in LA, and I'm going to give AJ a chance to talk about uh, that no, as well. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> I want to just talk about you know, pending draft regulations, what you think is going to happen, and most importantly, what you're doing to... Yeah, I mean, you know, I, think, I think California is doing... A, it seems like it's, it's going in a decent direction, right? There's obviously a lot of different interests. Um, so, for example, the, the W-2 uh, issue we brought up, where, you know, in the new regulations, every person who touched the plant has to be an employee of a licensee, right? That's being driven by labor unions. And, you know, right or wrong, it's, it's an interest that isn't necessarily aligned with the long-term... Um, success of the industry. I think it's going to be very difficult for cultivators, for example, to have W2 Another one is hours. So if you look at the draft regs, um, cannabis businesses, including delivery, can operate between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. Right? When we look at our data, that's not really when people are ordering. Right? People, people certainly have 6 a.m. Like, you know, we see the majority of our orders coming in between 7 and 10 p.m., right? Um, and so Prop you know, D is a zoning rule that was passed a couple years ago 
very political rule. How controversial can I be? Uh, a very monopolistic rule. Let it all hang out. Prop D is unenforceable. It's unconstitutional. It's too broadly written. What it does is it pla places zoning rules not just on the shop, the, the, where the plant originates from, but in the vehicles themselves. So if you're ordering Chinese food, for example, Prop D would say that the vehicle that is, that's transporting the food needs to be zoned the same way as the store. It makes no sense. Um, it goes against our Constitution of California. You cannot uh, zone a home. You cannot zone a vehicle. You cannot prevent anyone from using the roads. You cannot zone a transaction that happens in someone's private residence. We have the right of our own of our, the freedom of our own home, our own premise. Uh, the city disagrees with me. The city says that they do have a right to ban deliveries. I say we don't. I say that Speedweed has never broken a law, never broken a rule, never ever in our existence have we done so. And when we found ourselves on the other side of a regulation like labor, we fixed it. Well, um, essentially, we got affected uh, not nearly as severely as AJ, of course, but um, they did send us a letter. We had three locations in LA. We had South Bay, we had downtown, we had West Side, and oh God, we were doing an enormous amount of business with our partner dispensaries. And this was about two years ago. They came in and they shut us down. We got a letter um, basically saying if we didn't shut down, we're going to face the same sort of lawsuit that AJ faced. And um, essentially, we closed our shop. And um, we don't operate in the city of Los Angeles anymore. Um, we were, it was actually kind of a good thing. We were forced to go into many other locations, and heck, now we're, uh, we're about to be operating in over 80 different cities Last throughout The topic California. here is about the future. Um, there are outrageous articles out there about how drones are going to do delivery and autonomous oh, vehicles are going to do delivery. Uh, I have sort of more basic questions like, is Amazon going to do this? Are the normal logistics channels going to be a big player? Um, yeah, some other here's too, but let, let's start that way. Uh, how long is cannabis delivery, specifically cannabis delivery, and not like delivering anything. Yeah, I mean, I actually do think eventually cannabis would be delivered via drone, right? Eventually it would be delivered self-driving car. You know, is it going to be five years, 10 years, 20 years? That's, that's the question, but clearly, um, you know, technology is headed in that direction, not just cannabis, but all kinds of other products. Um, I also think Amazon will be there, right? If you're, if you're in retail anything today and you're not thinking about Amazon at least a little bit, um, you're kind of crazy because they are crushing almost every other industry. Now, I think in cannabis, we probably have a little bit of time, right? We probably have until some sort of national or federal legalization before a company like Amazon can think about this. Um, well, so certainly, uh, we, we feel drones will be a key essential um, to the future of the industry. Uh, when, will, when will that happen? We're not sure. Of course, it's up to the feds. Um, we don't think anything's going to happen until it becomes federally legal. questions. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So my question is about, um, you know, in the delivery model, you kind of take away the personal uh, experience, right? And so I'm curious how you balance uh, educating uh, and onboarding a new user base um, and like what uh, each of you guys are uh, doing in terms of, you know, utilizing the platform for, you know, the last mile, so to speak, and how that translates toward onboarding new users by, <clears throat> by educating them about uh, cannabis as a, as a wellness and lifestyle. Well, I think product. I touched this uh, fairly uh, in, in my previous conversation. Um, basically, we go ahead and we train our drivers and uh, we let them know about our current promotions. Um, that way, the end user is able to go ahead and find another promotion that'll essentially work with section on each one. client. And essentially, a, a great example is a client called up maybe about three weeks ago, went ahead and told us they had some foot problems. Well, one of our uh, dispensaries went ahead and saw those notes, touched base with the customer, and um, because of that, uh, the customer ended up leaving a five-star view, basically letting us know, man, these people, they really care. They let us know all about, you know, um, uh, these different things that could help or help my foot, and essentially, uh, they were extremely helpful. They came right to the door, what may have you. So we think that note section is extremely um, integral to going ahead and providing a great customer experience for the next quarter. Hello. So I was just wondering, do, um, do any of you have open job positions? <laughs> Tons. Yeah, awesome. there's a partner awesome. section on our website. You can definitely check it out. And do you ever have problems finding good quality to, like candidates and I'd finding the right people? I'd say we get right about people? five to six people applying every day. It's pretty insane. And they're good, all, all good quality? Well, or? you know, some are better than others, what may have you. <laughs> okay, cool. Thank you. Without Anyone? even my knowledge, we were actually already on Postmates. They put us on there. 
Um, so uh, essentially, if someone wants to, um, they can essentially place an order on Postmates. I, I, I had no clue up until recently. So yeah, I mean, we're open to everything and anything. Hi, um, I'm with Zona Medical, and we do scaled um, medical guidance that's condition specific. And I'm just wondering from you guys, you know, how much demand you see, um, just kind of in terms of the content, UX, and conversions, which is obviously a priority. How much demand there is for folks to actually address the effect that's going to have on their condition, or is it really just a ra about kind of a multitude of products um, and sorting through the products and doing that? Is there any, what's the demand for that and how are you addressing it? And um, how do you see it going forward? From a medical standpoint, I guess it's separating medical and recreational in some way. Um, our dispatchers and drivers are trained. You know, we have a doctor come in and, and talk to them about what the products are and how they can uh, help with different ailments and different illnesses. But every conversation that our customer service person has ends with, but everybody's different. You have to find your own path, go slow, go low, and figure it out for yourself. Because it, it treats everybody different. So sativa makes me tired, and indica, you know, it amps me up. Everybody's wired differently. So it's, it, it's hard. It's, it's, we're, we're organisms. We're, we're, we're all unique snowflakes. <laughs> I would think this is a question we get almost every day. Uh, what medication is used for this? What, how can I use this? What may have you? We can't answer any of these questions because we're not doctors. Um, so it is kind of a gray area in the industry right now. We hope in the future uh, to maybe find some sort of loophole by maybe bringing on an on-site doctor that can talk to some specific patients. But it just seems like kind of a stretch at this point. So we're looking for some sort of laws that's going to change and essentially allow for some sort of recommendation by some sort of, uh, you know, um, caregiver, so to say, rather than from a doctor. Being here, I want to thank all the <laughs> panelists individually.